Hey guys, what's up and welcome to the start of my end of year, end of 2019 wrap up and top 10 style videos and in this one unfortunately we are going to be talking about my most disappointing books that I read in 2019. So just to clarify, these are not the worst books I read in 2019. I could have a book on this list that I gave like a four stars to but it might be on this list because I expected it to be five stars. So just to clarify, it's not necessarily the worst books, it's just the ones where I was expecting more either because of like the hype or the synopsis or just my own expectations. So a lot of these books I did really enjoy, just not as much as I had hoped that I would. These are also in no particular order, they're just as I sort of thought of them. So with that said, let's just get on with my list. So the first book that disappointed me this year should not come as a surprise to anyone if you've been following my channel this year, and that is Wicked Saints by Emily A. Duncan. This book is a very wintry, Slavic-inspired YA fantasy. The story basically follows a young girl who has these god-given magical powers. It was hyped up to be, like, spectacularly dark and gritty and gruesome and bloody and very gothic, and I was expecting, like, this Skyrim-esque bloody gothic fantasy, but unfortunately um, this book was severely disappointing in my opinion. Just to get it out of the way, it was very much quite a blatant rip-off of Leigh Bardugo's Grishaverse trilogy. A lot of this just felt like a sort of rehashed poorly done version of that, um, specifically with the romance concern in this book, which is the main focal point of this book. Um, it's kind of a very insta-lovey, and I don't really mind, you know, angsty romances when they're done well, but this didn't really have any development, it didn't really have any basis, it was just the two young eligible teenagers were in close proximity and therefore they are deeply in love, and that is the entire basis of the relationship. And I was just expecting so much more. The quotation on the front of this book is Let them fear her and it made me think that this book would follow like a really kick-ass protagonist as she like took revenge on the people of the country that wronged her but she doesn't do that. She is an extremely passive character. She never really does anything. She just sort of does what the rest of the characters suggest maybe they should do. I was really disappointed in this. I do have a full really really ranty really long very unforgiving review of this book up there. I did give it three stars in the end, but that was mainly just because it reminded me of things like Skyrim and Dragon Age, but in a kind of rippy offy kind of way. The next book I read that disappointed me was The Last Wish by Andrei Sapkowski. So this is the first book in the Witcher series, which is the one that the video games and I guess now the TV show are loosely based on. This one is a collection of short stories and it forms sort of the basis of our main character Geralt's like background. I think I was just so disappointed by this one because I had seen so much hype to do with video games and people that are a fan of this series are like really big fans of this series. So I think I just expected a lot more. I had heard as well that there were so many fantastic and like diverse kick-ass female characters in this series but I think a lot of my disappointment stems from the fact that of the two sort of proactive and really interesting like female characters in this book, the main character sleeps with them both. I don't know, the culmination of both of their stories tends to be like, they, they just sleep with Geralt. And so I was a bit miffed at like, well, if all of the interesting female characters are just there to sleep with the main character, that doesn't really make them interesting in their own right. I feel like they're just there to make him look better for having slept with them. So I wasn't a huge fan of that. I do have a whole reading vlog of this and there's a lot more of my thoughts in there and I think in like the wrap up after I read this. But ultimately I had just really really expected to be like an instant fan of this series, the same as everyone else, and I think if I just played the video games first I would feel that way. I'm willing to give it another shot, but this one really did disappoint me. The third book on my list for disappointing is Wakenhurst by Michelle Paver. So I read this over Halloween because it purported to be a very dark and witchy tale. The synopsis does in fact make quite a prominent mention of like this story that stretches over hundreds of years and focuses a lot on witchcraft and is very dark. However, I think my disappointment stems from the fact that the synopsis is kind of a stretch and kind of a lie because there is no witchcraft whatsoever in this book. The book basically follows a young girl named Maud in the like late 1800s growing up in a like remote manor house in Suffolk on the Fens and the only tiny mention 
of potential witchcraft is because another character in this book is a medieval historian and they are translating a manuscript about the life of a woman several hundred years ago who was potentially a saint, potentially in communication with God and there might have been some people in her time that reviled her and said you're not a saint, you know, this is a curse or you're a witch but it's all just there in translation and doesn't actually take part within the story so there's no witchcraft, there's no like spells or curses or rituals or anything like that and I was just really disappointed because I wanted like a dark, gothic, very witchy kind of read I wanted something that felt witchy, you know? because it mentioned witchcraft and all the sort of um, dark and thrilling gothic aspect of this is actually based entirely in theology and like guilt and divine punishment and that sort of thing so there is no witchcraft in this story and I think if I'd known that going in I wouldn't have been disappointed because I wouldn't have been expecting to get to the witchcraft every page I was thinking when are we gonna get to the witchcraft and we never did so it wasn't a bad book it just wasn't what I wanted when I picked it up, which is unfortunate. Next on my list, the fourth book to disappoint me this year was The Infernal City by Greg Keyes. So this book is set in the universe of the Elder Scrolls, so the same as video games like Oblivion, and it takes place after Oblivion but before Skyrim. And I am such a big fan of those video games, so I love to read all the books and the lore like in the game and in that world, and so I assumed that I would just immediately love anything set in this universe. The synopsis makes it sound like we're going to be following a huge band of characters as they try and figure out like what this weird floating city is and why it has come to the realm of Tamriel and you know like how to stop it sort of thing um, and we do technically have that but I was picturing like a ragtag group of random people and I assumed that they would all be together but they're all like separate POVs which wasn't too bad but it kind of didn't give me that like big adventurer vibe that I thought I would get going in. The other main reason I was disappointed in this was because the entire first 100, 150 pages of this book is like someone took a load of crack and watched something like Kitchen Nightmares and <laughs> the entire first half of this book is the demonic cooking of the souls of the living but it's, it's just all really weird and so much of this book is just set in these weird kitchens and it was just a turn that I didn't expect it to take. It was kind of interesting because these sort of like weird demonic things do happen in this realm but a cooking based story I was not expecting <laughs> so I did find myself disappointed. The ending did make up for it but ultimately I think I would have just preferred a different setting. <laughs> Okay, the next one kind of sucks that I have to put it on this list, but I feel like a lot of other people did feel the same way that I did when they read it. And that was King of Skulls by Lee Bardugo. So I can't say too much about this because it does fall after the events of the original Grisha trilogy and also the events of Six of Crows. So I'm not going to go into spoiler territory, however I will say this book follows Nikolai and so I was quite eager to get back to his character. I was just really intrigued to see what was happening and get back to this character and see how things had developed after the events of like the previous stories. I think my disappointment stems from the fact that this is a book called King of Scars. It's very much like Nikolai's story. It's called the Nikolai duology. However, Nikolai is a character seemed to take a back seat to the other two POVs in this book. I think I was just expecting more from Nikolai and more things going on specifically with him. I will also say, without spoiling anything, there is a section that gets kind of really weird towards the end and I understand that that's just the way the story went, but I really was not a fan of that section. I didn't like the big shift um, that we went through and it just wasn't my thing. It wasn't really what I wanted to get out of this book. So I feel like that all sounds really vague because I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't read it. I did still give this like I think like a three point something stars. I did enjoy it. I was just disappointed because after how much I had enjoyed Six of Crows I just kept thinking that Lee Bardugo will just improve with every other book that she writes and so I was just really really hyped for this and I think the hype got to me and made me expect something that just wasn't in the final product. Okay, the next book that disappointed me this year was unfortunately The Beautiful by Renée Adier. So this book was sort of hyped up to be like the resurgence of gothic vampire literature and I was so excited to go into, even though it's a YA novel, I was still really excited to get back into like vampires because I love vampires, I'm all about vampires and the 
like marketing for this book was very very specific about this being like a vampire story and the comeback of vampires and I think everyone was super on board for that. Without spoiling anything though this isn't really a book about vampires. Vampires do exist however it's not a major sort of part of this exact storyline without really spoiling anything. The main story is about a girl who has fled Paris to come to New Orleans and she's trying to solve like this string of grisly murders and it's kind of more of like a mystery sort of YA romance thriller sort of thing which I didn't really mind and I do really like the historical setting of this book however I just wanted more vampires, more explicit vampires and just more really gothic vampire content in general. Um, and I think that is the fault of the marketing because the book itself and the synopsis does not make itself out to be a vampire book. Like it gives that vibe but I think if you had gone into this not expecting a vampire novel and just expected um, like a historical YA thrillery romance kind of thing then you would get exactly what you were looking for with the added bonus of like some very mild occasional vampire content but if you went into this expecting full-blown vampires like I did I feel like you would be disappointed as I was. Oh okay this next one believe me it hurts. It hurts to be on this list. It is Dark Dawn by Jay Kristoff. I am so sad that this book is on here. I will say I did still rate this four stars but it did also severely disappoint me because Nevernight, the first book in the series, I gave five out of five stars and so this is the third book in a three book series so I won't spoil anything but I was expecting the culmination of Mia's story to just blow me away. I just really expected this to be five stars. I just felt like it just missed the mark for me. I felt like the characters and the story tended to meander about quite a bit. It just felt kind of wishy-washy a lot of the reasons that they went certain places or did certain things. While I did really really like this one it just didn't feel as strong as the other two books in the series and I will say that, again without spoiling anything, while I was really satisfied to learn the end to Mia's story and see the conclusion of her story, I did feel like it wasn't really what I had been expecting and I didn't really think that the way that the book ended fit tonally, I guess, thematically with the rest of the books in the series. Other reasons why I was disappointed <laughs> include the fact that there was a new character in this book and I really despised them so much. I hated them, I couldn't care less about them and most of all I hated the effect that they had on the protagonist and the way that they changed the protagonist and I hated that. Um, and one of my favourite characters in this series that I was super excited to get back to is for one reason or another absent for most of the novel so I was so disappointed. I do still really like this book and I love the series overall. Jay Kristoff is one of my favourite authors and Nevernight will always be one of my favourite series. I just feel like this wasn't the ending the series deserved. I just feel like it could have been so much better. It wasn't quite as spectacular as I had wanted it to be and I'm very sad to say that so yeah really sad that this has to be on this list. Book number eight on my list of disappointing books is unfortunately Wayward Son by Rainbow Rowell. This is the sequel to Carry On which is sort of like a Harry Potter-esque story. You have a chosen one who goes to a magical school and much like Harry Potter solves like magical mysteries and issues and that sort of thing. I won't spoil the events of the first book or any spoilers from this book but this one is set up as a like cross-country road trip across America with the three friends from the first novel. And I was so excited to get back to these characters and continue their story and see how their relationships were developing but unfortunately this story again seemed to meander quite a bit, it didn't seem very sure of itself in like where we were going. I had just come back for these amazing characters and I just didn't feel like they lived up to the way that they were presented in the first book. There were all these interpersonal issues going on between them and all these things that could have been explored however it wasn't touched on really at any point in the novel. It just felt like you had these three characters who could all be sat in a room together but they weren't really interacting on any deep level and I really wanted to explore like those interpersonal relationships between them. I just wanted to 
go deeper into those characters and really explore them some more and explore what's going on between them but we didn't really get that in this book it was very surface level about it my other issue was that because it is so short this book cut off very very quickly the ending is basically like it, it almost ends mid scene entirely randomly very abruptly and i was actually really really annoyed by the way that it ended because it was just so sudden it just really wasn't what i was expecting after having enjoyed the first book so much and yeah i was just really disappointed i guess with the direction this took okay the second to last book on this list and this is another one where it is potentially on like my highest rated books of the year list but this one i feel like i was disappointed for a very specific reason and that is the binding by bridget collins i rated this like a 4 or a 4.25 but I had wanted to rate this a 5 stars and going into it I had expected it to be a 5 star read. This is a historical gothic novel about a world in which books can erase your memory. So if you have something painful that you want to forget, you go to a bookbinder and they extract your memory and bind it into a novel. And the main character in this book is a boy called Emmett Farmer. One day he's called to be the apprentice to a bookbinder and while he's working there he finds a book that has his name on it, meaning that there must be something that he has previously forgotten Gotten, but obviously he does not know why. So that was the setup to the book, that's basically in the synopsis, but I will say the majority of this book is spent in Emmett's point of view. A lot of it is about him obsessing over what might have been so horrible that he tried to forget it and that forms like the big question of a lot of the novel as you follow him and obviously you're in his head a lot of the time because it's told in first person and so that is sort of like the major bulk of like the first I want to say like 200 to 300 pages. However, when I went to the author signing like a day after the book's release, the author did tell us very explicitly what he had forgotten and she does not consider it to be a spoiler and if you look up anything about this book it will pretty much be in like every review ever. I went into this book fully knowing this and everyone else that came to all the author signings did, as did anyone I imagine who looked at the categories this was in on Amazon and that sort of thing so it's not really a spoiler and for me it was actually a selling point of the book but I just feel like if I hadn't known it I would have enjoyed the mystery aspect a bit more because if you know this thing there is no mystery aspect to the book. The entire sort of like tension and mystery of the novel and all these weird things that have been going on all focus on the question of why are these people acting this way? What is it that Emmett has done? What has he forgotten that has led to things being the way that they are? But obviously once you know what it is that he's forgotten. It kind of takes away all like the tension, all like the mystery aspect of this book and when you go into it knowing that it just means that while the writing is beautiful and while the story is beautiful that sort of like tension, the thing that pulls you in and the mystery that keeps you guessing throughout the book is not present because obviously you already know what he's forgotten, you don't need that question answering, you already know, so you don't feel that same tension that's mirrored like in his own monologue. The entire like first like chunk of this book is all relying on the reader being drawn in by the mystery and if you know what the answer is then there isn't a mystery. While I did really enjoy that book I was just disappointed because it didn't reach that five stars for me and maybe if I had had the enjoyment of not knowing all the twists and answers before I went into it maybe I would have enjoyed it that much more but I'll never know. <laughs> And finally number 10, the last book on my list and I think actually possibly this one is the most disappointing of all the books that I read this year. And that is The Fate of the Tealing by Erica Johansson. Now this is the third book in a three book series so again I'm not going to spoil the events of this book or the previous books. The story of book one is that a young girl called Kelsey, I think she turns 19 years old, and she is a princess in hiding who is actually the heir to the throne. She's been kept safely like secreted in the countryside and now she is going to resume her throne, you know, uh, retake her crown and begin her reign of the kingdom and that's sort of the setup of the first book. I really loved the first book and I really hated the second book and so coming to this book it was like a make or break for the series for me. It was will I really love this in the end or will I really hate it? Guess which way it went. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been disappointed by a book quite in the manner that this one managed to disappoint me because I went into this with low expectations. Because the second book had been so bad and I'd hated it so much in comparison to the first, I was not expecting a lot from this book. However, we spent a lot of time developing the villain and the villain's motives and backstory in this book and I will say I really really loved the villain in this book because of how much I genuinely hated the villain in this book. I hated them so much but 
in a way that like you're supposed to hate a villain. I was really, really satisfied with the way that the villain had been built up and what this would mean for like the end game of the story. And so I got to like the halfway point in this book and I was really starting to think, oh my god, this book might be as good as the first one. Oh, and then the end. This book committed quite a literal unforgivable sin for any book, in my opinion, and I can't spoil it, I'm not going to spoil it, I honestly don't think you should read this series because of the way that this concludes. First book is great, just read the first book and make it up from there, because you might as well. It's basically all the character plot lines and threads that I had been following since book one, so many things were left on such cliffhangers and such tense moments and I was so ready to have all of these questions answered, I was so ready to see who lived and who died, I was just so ready to have all these plot threads finally tied off and get the answers to all these questions that I'd been asking, some of them which I'd been asking since book one. You don't get any answers to your questions, you don't get any sort of meaningful resolution, pretty much none of the characters get resolutions, basically is the author saying I don't care about any of the other stuff I've been writing or any of the other stuff you've been reading, we're doing this other thing now. And the ending is just this other thing, so you never get the answers to all the questions that you'd been waiting to see answered. You never get to see, you know, what happens to this character or what happens to this quest or any of this. You just, it doesn't matter. And so I've just never been disappointed by a book in a way that this one disappointed me. And it just felt so insulting a way to end a series. The fact that you had kept readers coming back to your work just to push through, just to see what would happen at the end, and then to deny them that is just... It feels kind of like I've been trolled. It's like it purposefully tried to raise my expectations for what this book could give me, all just to purposefully dash any hope I had of enjoying this book right at the very last second. And I have never been as disappointed by the end to a book as I have by this. So that is why this one is tippy top of my list. The rest were in no order, but this, this is number one. Most disappointing thing I've ever read. So there you go. Those were all the most disappointing books I read this year. It's really unfortunate that I have to say this about some books, but I feel like this is just the way that expectations work, you know? Sometimes you go in with low expectations and you're pleasantly surprised, and then other times you expect too much and you're left disappointed. And that's just kind of the way that things are. So do let me know in the comments down below, did you feel the same as me about any of these books? And if not, then maybe what was the book that you were most disappointed by this year? With that said, that is pretty much all I have for this video. Hopefully you guys liked it, and so hopefully I will see you in another video down the line. I do have the rest of like my top 10 style videos, so like the best of the year, the worst of the year, and then like some other little fun ones that I have. So hopefully you'll stay tuned for those, but until then, peace out booktube! Mm -hmm.